if, if we were to say take Bitcoin and remove those that one feature, which is I can do this without permission, it has no value over any other money, right? It's no better than the euro or gold or any, anything else, um, or credit, right? Because because that is really the only thing that makes it um, more useful than, than those monies, right? That, is that I can do it without permission, presumably. And if we, if we create a system where, for example, the only way you can feasibly use Bitcoin is by going through some central inter intermediary, right? That intermediary in, in Kazakhstan is gonna be controlled by the state. And um, if we only, if the only people who mine Bitcoin are you know, these mega farms, that cannot hide, right? <laughs> they're, they're they're taking down you know gigawatts of energy every exactly. every week. They're not hiding, which means they can be controlled. And if you can control the majority of hash power in Bitcoin, you control everything, right? You you okay. you, you you can't make people change their rules and their nodes, which is what Bitcoiners like to say. But you can prevent them from transacting. And by preventing them from transacting, you can demand their identity when they do transact, right? You can require somebody show ID when they want to make a transaction. So you can demask everything. You can also charge them a fee beyond the market transaction fee. You can charge them um, demurrage for their money, which is equivalent to inflation. So they can't transact without paying the transaction tax. So um, so, so the idea that we work on is, as you know, technology people, in order to make this money usable, right, um, for people who need it, um, <laughs> is to is to make it um, effective for people to both mine and accept Bitcoin privately. Um, if you can, if you can do it without a step, without anybody being able to establish your identity, it makes it much harder to find you, and that's the reason for decentralization. But it also, it, it's not enough. <laughs> just, just decentralization is not enough. Having a million miners in the world that all pay taxes yes. does nothing. It, um, now, people will argue, well, in some jurisdictions. It might be okay, and and you know everything can move there, but that's kind of the situation we already have with state money, right? If that worked, if political solutions worked, we wouldn't need Bitcoin. Welcome to the show, Ludmila and Bota. Thank you so much. We're still waiting for Eric Vasquez, but he'll jump in. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it for your time and taking out of your busy schedule. I'm really looking forward to your talk, to our discussion. I think it's going to be very fascinating, very fruitful, very complimentary discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, before I go on a rant, <laughs> which I usually do, why don't you just, Ludmila, why, yeah, why don't you just start off with your background? Like, I know you're a human rights advocate, both of you, a, a, you know, uh, but why don't you just start off about your background and and what are you doing in this space and the connection with Bitcoin? Oh, hi guys! Yeah, I hi, 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 hi. we want to say hi to everyone. We don't know how many online to just yes. want to say hi. Exactly. So um, I'm originally Ukrainian, uh, and uh, for me, human rights work uh, began since. I've been a teenager, uh, but professional human rights work since I was on PhD in Poland in 2009. So it's almost 15 years right now. Uh, how we together with Bota work on human rights, defending people who are politically persecuted. What does it mean? It means that those who criticize the government, uh, those who are independent journalists, entrepreneurs, lawyers, judges, and so on, they Prosecuted just because exercising their freedom, their rights, and criticizing with arguments, uh, for example, governments. And for this reason, they can be tortured, they can be imprisoned arbitrarily, uh, and so on and so on. And our role to be this bridge, to bring these voices to international institutions, to defend these people. We do an individual advocacy. And as a regard of this, uh, we were also working on those who are not only politically persecuted inside the countries, but also those who persecuted outside of the countries. And for example, one of the most favorite instrument, which we together with Bota was working on, um, is reform of Interpol, which was in, in, intensively abused by authoritarian regimes. Uh, and um, after years, we understood also that the reason why authoritarian regime are able to abuse Interpol, and it actually lays in recommendations of financial action task forces and uh, all of us knowing anti-money laundering countries regulation because they allow to obtain data, send data, exchange information, 
you know, fabricate easily cases uh, uh, with provisions of uh, emergency that you need to arrest this or that uh, person accused on extremist money laundering and so on and so on, threat to national security. And it's not just theoretical that we were kind of working on this reform, we were releasing these people, we were defending them, but we also became a victims uh, of these kind of attacks. And this is a moment uh, where together with Bota and many other of our activists, Open Dialogue Foundation was financially excluded, our bank accounts were terminated in European Union. Um, so uh, I was also announced by three authoritarian regimes as a threat to national security. And um, as a result of it, we were not able to use traditional financial instruments. And this is the moment when we started to use Bitcoin. So I want to ask also Bota, if you can also explain what happens with you, because you are one of the most brightest examples yeah, what's absolutely. happened uh, with lawyers, with members of our organization. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Kevan, for inviting us. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I am uh, originally from Kazakhstan, but I have a political asylum in Belgium. So I now live uh, in Brussels, Belgium, and Luda lives there as well, because she's originally from Ukraine. And uh, I am a lawyer by training, I'm actually a US trained lawyer, member of New York Bar. But uh, at some point of my life, I became a human rights defender because, um, you know, I believe in uh, two things. I believe in market competition, but also I believe in political competition. And uh, this, my belief basically led me to uh, one uh, big mistake. Mistake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mistake from the point of view of the regime in, in my home country, Kazakhstan. Basically, um, I started defending a position that was persecuted by the regime. And uh, when I started doing that, and um, we, we've been doing together with Luda, with, uh, with other human rights defenders, with a lot of lawyers, I kind of um, became a um, subject of the attacks of the regime. Because when you're effective, you create a lot of enemies. Right when you help to release a political prisoner, when you bring uh, like outrageous cases of torture to the attention of international community, and there are consequences for uh, for the countries, so uh, they get uh, to say it mildly upset with you, and they go after you. And it started with a smear campaign, but what Luda mentioned that uh, we were working on the reform of Interpol, but because one of the issues that I faced, and actually a lot of activists and human rights defenders faced, uh, I was, uh, at the request of Kazakhstan, I was what was put on the Interpol most wanted list. Uh, and they they had Interpol issuing red notice against me, and this is how they wanted to take me, get me out of Belgium. And uh, when that didn't work, because uh, in, Interpol actually recognized that my case was politically motivated, Kazakhstan couldn't um, couldn't uh, extradite me uh, from Belgium because I had political protection in Belgium. I still have. They tried to use third country, Ukraine. It's uh, they they ask Ukraine to send an extradition request, and that failed as well. So what they did, they sent agents to try to kidnap me from the territory of Belgium. And thanks to the effective federal police of Belgium, uh, that case was basically disclosed by them and people were in the end sentenced. But uh, all the things when they, they saw that they couldn't do anything uh, against me in terms of making me <laughs> shut up, uh, forcing me to stop from the work that I was doing. They made a criminal complaint against me on Belgium soil and they accused me in money laundering. So that I'm basically living in Belgium and I'm doing money laundering. And they even chose like a ridiculous amount accusing me in money laundering of 500 million euros, which is absolutely outrageous. But um, you kind of have to look beyond the numbers. What happens when you accused of something like that? You would think it's ridiculous, but the instruction judge, you know, who receives the case, he gets scared. Like, what is it? It's like we have this international crime criminal now. So, so they open the case, but then they very quickly realize that there's nothing behind those allegations. 
but the procedure allows a uh, kind of the complainant kind of uh, party it's it's called parti civil right it's a victim alleged victim right um, kind of the procedure that existed allows um to like kind of appeal appeal make additional complaints etc cetera, etc cetera. so i had a state who was claiming that they are a kind of um you know this miserable victim and the state with limited resources kept appealing 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 and that case was dragged for a long time until it was finally closed but um so Th that show demonstrated me that the risk, how easily you can be accused in something. So they basically say the crime happened in Kazakhstan. There is no need to prove it. But money laundering is happening in Belgium. And then again, they, they don't re really expect to show much. They expect Belgian police to destroy my life to that extent that I cannot anymore function as a lawyer or human rights defender. And um, th this uh, kind of led to the fact that uh, when they were not successful with, uh, you, you know, like arresting me, extraditing me or kidnapping me, they took my brother hostage in Kazakhstan. Because what, what they got, they got my data in that criminal case, my banking data. And what is banking data? Banking data is your roadmap to your life. It shows all your connections. It shows all your vulnerabilities. And that demonstrated to them that my weak point is my family back in Kazakhstan. And that's how they uh, identified my brother and they went after him and they took him hostage, accusing again in money laundering. And they tried to force him to like uh, to force me to go back to the country. My brother completely refused. He was tortured, and only because of the interference of international institutions like European Parliament, like the U.S. State Department, the torture was stopped, and in the end, my brother was released from Kazakhstan. But all of this kind of my personal experience led how uh, to the conclusion uh, how easily. A lot of uh, like instruments, international cooperation instruments, can be abused by the regimes like one in Kazakhstan, and this is so. So in in the kind of during the process during this all this ordeal that was happening to me, uh, like I had Belgium banks closing bank accounts, and this is Ludo Lud already described it, and it was happening mainly because of the accusations and a big smear campaign online against me. And when you have no bank account, what, what, what happens? What, like you start looking for the alternatives, right? You start looking for the alternatives and, and you think uh, what people can do in this situation and who else facing this problem. And that's how we discovered that they actually the number of so-called unbanked people is quite in Europe, large. In democratic countries. In, in democratic the countries, in the European Union. And that's actually a lot of activists, a lot of human rights defenders, people like dissidents, people from diasporas, they face that. They're already citizens of the EU or uh, like lawful, um, you know, residents, but they still have this problem. And the biggest problem is that they're afraid to speak about it. So we kind of decided that we should not be afraid and we should discuss the problem of de-risking, the problem of unwarranted debanking. And that's how it led us to the whole issue of dealing with anti-money laundering, contrary financing of terrorism regulations. Now, before I put my comment, this is so much to unpack, of course, but this is incredible, incredible. I mean, what you both have uh, on different levels, you know, experience, uh, would it be the representation of, I don't know, political for prosecution, false, you know, accusations and prosecution and, and, and yeah, the torture of your brother. I mean, this is incredible. So uh, we've got um, Eric Vasco, finally, he, he made it. Uh, welcome to the show, Eric. How are you doing? Long time no see. Sorry for the delay, technical. Yeah, before we start recording, I, I was mentioning to Ludmila, you know, uh, why I, I thought it was would be a good idea to bring you guys together because, uh, first of all, the whole... Uh, you know, holistically speaking, you can't distangle, you know, uh, or detach it, uh, the whole uh, the topic of Bitcoin from human rights, human rights or fundamental human rights or human rights advocacy. Uh, and, you know, with your vast spectrum of knowledge, would it be technical or the principles, <laughs> principle, uh, principles or principle economic principles of, of Bitcoin? 
and you know you're well known in the space and and also the the project on the within the open dialogue foundation which is uh, which ludmila is the director or the president of, uh and with their mission and their objective i thought maybe you you could somehow help them or or multiply them with an, with your network with with your knowledge with some kind of input so yeah i don't know um but well, thank you, first of all, Bata, for this very really detailed uh, explanation and and you know uh, the history of of of, of, of you, from your perspective, and Ludmila, uh, you want to like give a short background about yourself, uh, Eric, just for the viewers and also for Ludmila and Bata. I'm um, sure. Yeah, it's it's really nice to meet all of you. And again, sorry for uh, being rude, showing up late. I'm supposed to be the technical one. Um, let me see my background. I, I uh, long time ago, I got a computer science degree. Um, I got bored at IBM and I, I went into the Navy. I did that for 10 years, uh, flew airplanes, fighters, did the Bosnian War twice, um, graduated from Top Gun, taught tactics for a while, and then left the Navy after about 10 years. Um, I did that to form a tech startup. I finally realized that what I liked about software was kind of building uh, something on my own and a business. And so um, that suited me much better. I did uh, a couple startups starting in like 98. And by 2006, sold the first one to Microsoft. The other one, the second one is still out there. It's called Beyond Trust. Um, I don't have a part of it anymore. I sold out. But uh, and then I did a third one that, that failed. And then I um, and then I found Bitcoin. I've been doing, uh, I started working on a hardware wallet uh, before Trezor was even out, I think. And uh, I, I decided not to ship that, but I kept working on the open source project it was um, using called the Bitcoin um, project was started by Amir Taki. So I've been doing that um, for about 10 years, um, started writing about theory, uh, economics, um, came on actually, I think came to my conference in, in Hanoi uh, in, in leap year 2020. And we, uh, um, we talked about that and um, I don't know. I, I still work on the Bitcoin. I, 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 I've traveled a lot. I've been to probably 90 countries around the world um, for different reasons. Uh, spoken a lot on Bitcoin. And um, I don't know. I guess that's it. What else? What else is it? <laughs> yeah. I wrote a book. It's out there. Went with the conference. I do have a question because you just mentioned it. You, due to the fact that you've been you know, traveling a lot of countries, uh, what, what is your experience? I mean, when it comes to, you know, fundamental human <laughs> rights or, you know, because the ethos of Bitcoin and actually Ludmila always, you know, articulates it in this way. It's like peer to peer, you know, as, as, as it says, you know, in the, in Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, peer to peer electronic cash, you know, freedom tech, you always emphasize those things. Right. So uh, it, do you have a perspective like Eric, like, or do, have you encountered uh, cases <laughs> personally when it comes to human right or uh, the, uh, you know, making, making like using Bitcoin that's totally uh, detached, you know, from any necessity of whether it's under-regulated, regulated, over-regulated, over like, do we really need to pay attention to that, uh, which we're going to come, you know, eventually to dis to discuss together with Bota and Ludmilla. Um, w w what's the experience? I mean, what's the, what's the connection between using Bitcoin and human rights? Well, it, it is the only reason for Bitcoin and you know, it's, it's way I tend to look at it is, is um, it's, it's not for me, right? Um, I born and raised in the U S um, yes. I'm financially secure. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess my, my, my feeling is to say I'm really lucky. I don't, I don't know if it's luck or not, but um, that's, that's my situation. And uh, you know, I have traveled a lot, but um, most of the travel I you know, Europe is, it's easy. Europe's the U.S. as far as I'm concerned, as far as travel, most of it, right? Not all of it. Um, you know, Asia, Saint, Saint Africa, South America, and most of it is just, you know, just like going to the next state or something. It's not a big deal, but there, there, you know, there's certain places, and I, I've been to some that, that need Bitcoin, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I, I didn't get involved because I was looking to make some money on the, you know, the number go up. That, that was not, the, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm really a, kind of a passive index investor. I, you know, it's based on, and I, for over 25 years, I just, you know, I retired before Bitcoin existed. So um, this was not a way for me to make some cash. It was, um, um, it, it put together a lot of things I was interested in, right? I, I've always been a strong proponent of individual um human liberty. I started off a 20 year kind of 
Libertarian Party card carrying member in the U.S. And I finally dropped that and decided I was just an anarchist. I'm not a minarchist. Um, but I see that as a, a personal philosophy, right? And then um, I, uh, because of that, probably I'm a long-term student of economics. Um, I am a tech person, uh, but I'm also a military person, right? I, I, so I, I, I understand realistic threat model. Um, I'm a long-term martial artist. I, I understand various aspects of combat and, and, and where security really comes from. And so, so to me, Bitcoin put all these things together. So on one hand, it was just interesting. It, it, it's what I like. And um, uh, I felt I could just keep doing it until something else came along. Um, but uh, the reason for Bitcoin, apart from my interest, right, the reason for Bitcoin is, um, is to help people defend themselves and, and you know, their property against attacks by the state. And, you know, there's plenty of that in the West, but it's, it's, um, there's other ways to do it and privacy is almost impossible. So if you're not able to hide, it really doesn't matter anyway. Right? So we, we talk about decentralization. Decentralization does not make anything securable against like a state threat, right? It, it, like for example, business around the world is highly decentralized, right? Millions of companies, they're not all run by one person. But they all pay tax. All, they all want, all white market companies pay tax, and and any any simple control, you know, FinCEN, whatever, can be applied to all of them with a stroke of a pen. So that's not a security model, right? Decentralization isn't the goal. Decentralization is a tool to to allow you to be able to hide. Uh, operating at small scale um, is how black markets survive, right? They you know the bigger they get, the harder they are to sustain. Um, so Bitcoin has these things. I mean, whether Satoshi understood it or not is irrelevant, right? I, I think to, to the most, for the most part, um, he or she did, but, um, there were certain things that were completely unexplained and contradictory in statements made, et cetera. So it doesn't really matter what, what Bitcoin is. If you look at the, the technology, um, and the economics of it is it's a way, I mean, peer to peer electronic cash. What does that mean? It, 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 it can operate without a central authority. Right, and, and it's money. Right, it's not it's not credit. It's cash, um, and it's electronic. So in the old days, people would use gold for this, but gold's not very useful in an, in an electronic world. You can't ship it down a wire. That's only credit for gold, which is it takes you back to the same problem. So you know, and Satoshi said this. We you know maybe we can strike a small blow for you know human liberty. So that's that's really the only reason. It's the value proposition. It's you know if, if the number's going up. Presumably that's why, I mean, you know, if, if the value proposition goes away, well, then why not just use dollars or euros? And the value proposition is you can do this without permission. You can do it privately and you don't have to ask anybody for permission. That's it. If you take that away, there's nothing else. There's no other value to it whatsoever. Um, no other unique value to it whatsoever. So um, we work I on those I will have things. to disagree with Eric <laughs> that there is no other value. Sorry, what other value is that? But you know, my uh, like I I feel like it's my uh, human right defender nature is kind of fighting yes. inside of me, and I want to defend Bitcoin. That uh, actually, it's exactly what you said. It's uh, money, electronic money, decentralized money, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the value in that, right? Mm -hmm. This is uh, there is no value if you are talking from the uh, kind of. Mm, I, I don't want to use this word, but I will have to, from the privilege perspective. The privilege, I yes. mean, you live in a country where privacy is in a way a little bit protected, but what most importantly, your uh, property is protected. Your uh, physical integrity is protected, right? If uh, you are attacked by somebody, there, there is a system of law enforcement. If you are, uh, that defends you, if your money is stolen, you can sue the, like, 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 uh, the perpetrator, et cetera, et cetera. What uh, like I have to put the use of Bitcoin a little bit in the context, right? And in the context where uh, that exists for the majority of the world. First of all, we have to remember that the majority of the world is not free. It's actually uh, free countries, free liberal democracies. It's a minority, and the number is kind of it, it's it's scary if you look at the statistics. If you look at the um, Freedom House, for example, index, you see how the number shrinking and shrinking place. Yeah, it's shrinking, shrinking space, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. getting the situation is getting worse everywhere, 
And uh, so we, we're looking at countries where we are coming from. You, you, you have to look at us as, as examples, what can happen to you as well. And what's happening in our country, for example, right? Why we speak about financial freedoms, not only in the context uh, of us being de-risked and had our bank accounts closed in uh, the European Union. No, we are looking at what's happening with the opposition in countries like, for example, my home country, Kazakhstan. Um, it's not only uh, like, like uh, it's, uh, you know, like, like any opposition activities basically uh, becomes illegal, right? If you, like, like for example, I am a member of an uh, organization that is called, it's a democratic, uh, it's a, it's a kind democratic of- Democratic choice of Kazakhstan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to say it's a peaceful opposition movement, yeah. democratic yeah. choice of Kazakhstan. And what uh, what Kazakhstan does when the number of the, uh, like the number of the members of that organization reach 100,000 in the uh, Telegram chat, they immediately ban that uh, organization, yeah. uh, that movement as an extremist organization. And what happens after? For example, there is an activist that gets arrested, right? Or a political prisoner. You want to yeah. help that uh, political prisoner. You're trying to raise some some money. And in the past, what we did, we uh, like like some well-known activists would put a bank account number online on social media, for example, on Facebook and Instagram, right? And people would donate. And that would be small donations, like five, ten. Like, like 10, it's even more, like too much, 10 euros. Like I would say up to three, five euros, right? Donations. But that's how you raise 300 euros that you need to pay legal fees, for example. Sure. And, but what's happening right now with the use, with the instruments that Financial Action Task Force mm -hmm. provided, it's actually anti-money laundering, countering financing of terrorism regulations. All yeah. banks, they act as an instrument, basically like as a law enforcement branch. Yeah, they're branch of the state. That, that's all they are. Yeah. Exactly. And they immediately yeah. shut down accounts and they immediately release the data to yeah. the secret service of everyone who was donating money. And those yeah. people charge they, with they, financing. They, don't, they presumably don't do that because that's a good business. They do that because they have no choice. Right. That's the state. They're part of the system yeah. because they're relatives, they're kind yeah. of business it's, uh, partners. You, you know, it's usually banking system. You don't have the option. Like some, uh, you, you know, some kind of uh, victims that that forced to do it. It's usually there are a few banks in the country uh, that are by, by some oligarchs that members mm -hmm. of the family, of the president. But, but if you wanted that, to create a bank to operate otherwise, right, to not do that, you couldn't, right? It's not, no, you can't. It's not absolutely, a choice. Absolutely, absolutely. You that's have to operate insane. outside yeah. of any financial institution, regulated financial institutions. The same it right. goes to any platform that is, uh, for example, exchanges, right? Because right, right. they're regulated and they're they regulated exactly the same the same way, way. And they're owned by people close to the regimes. Nobody who is not loyal is not going to own anything significant in the uh, financial sector. Right. That's I mean, I, to me, that's all you know, straightforward. I, I, I understand. Right. I mean, I, I've never lived it, but I certainly understand it. What I don't understand is, is what you're disagreeing with. Um, no, 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 I'm not disagreeing, but I, that's where the value of Bitcoin comes to us. Right, right, that's that, what I'm that, saying. <laughs> that, that it comes, it's like we don't look at it as a store of value thing because we cannot right. afford right. it most of the time. It's a but money. For us, this is a means of uh, this um, kind of, you know, p uh, through the peer-to-peer -peer transactions, from uh, uh, self-hosted wallets. We can right. raise money. We can, uh, you know, help people who who require the need. We can pay fines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right, right. So that that's that is exactly what I'm describing. I mean, maybe you know, maybe some people don't. I I, I speak yeah. kind of in the abstract sometimes, and people don't always connect what I'm saying to what they're thinking. But that's what I'm saying, right? Like the 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 value proposition of Bitcoin is getting the state out of your money, right? I can do it. I can transfer money to somebody else. I can give them, you know, a few, a few, a few Bitcoin, a few dollars, a few euros, whatever, worth of Bitcoin, um, and they can receive it without any needing permission from the state, without the state being able Absolutely. to step in through yeah. their banking intermediaries or whoever, right? And you even see that it's happening. So, if if you if you live in a society where you don't really need that value proposition, right? It's not it's not as important. Now, I, I would argue that in the West, yeah, we have all these 
the, we have all these great things, but they they still tax a lot, like up to fifty percent of what you make, right? And so there there is an argument for you know for people to protect their savings against taxation, which inflation of their money is just taxation, right? It's but there's also privacy aspects, which you're describing. I can't do this without getting arrested, right? Um, I can't accumulate anything. I can't take it with me. I can't give it to anybody without highlighting, you know, your brother, for example. Um, so, so to me, if, if we were to say take Bitcoin and remove those that one feature, which is I can do this without permission, it has no value over any other money, right? It's no better than the euro or gold or any, anything else, um, or credit, right? Because because that is really the only thing that makes it um, more useful than than those monies, right? That, is that I can do it without permission, presumably. And if we if we create a system where, for example, the only way you can feasibly use Bitcoin is by going through some central inter intermediary, right? That intermediary in, in Kazakhstan is going to be controlled by the state. And um, if we only if the only people who mine Bitcoin are you know, these mega farms that cannot hide, right? <laughs> they're, they're they're taking down you know gigawatts of energy every exactly. every week. They're not hiding, which means they can be controlled. And if you can control the majority of hash power in Bitcoin, you control everything, right? You you okay. you, you you can't make people change their rules and their nodes, which is what Bitcoiners like to say, but you can prevent them from transacting. And by preventing them from transacting, you can demand their identity when they do transact, right? You can require somebody show ID when they want to make a transaction. So you can demask everything. You can also charge them a fee beyond the market transaction fee. You can charge them um Demarage for their money, which is equivalent to inflation. So they can't transact without paying the transaction tax. So um, there's really- you know, Don't give you know, ideas, they, don't give ideas. <laughs> you know, they, these are well known really. They don't have to read my book to, to know this. Um, so so the idea that we work on is, as you know, technology people, in order to make this money usable, right? Um, for people who need it um, <laughs> is, to, is to make it, um, effective for people to both mine and accept Bitcoin privately. Um, if you can, if you can do it without a step, without anybody being able to establish your identity, it makes it much harder to find you, and that's the reason for decentralization. But it also, it, it's not enough. <laughs> just, just decentralization is not enough. Having a million miners in the world that all pay taxes yes. does nothing. It, um, now, people will argue, well, in some jurisdictions, it might be okay, and and you know everything can move there. But that's kind of the situation we already have with state money, right? If that worked, if political solutions worked, we wouldn't need Bitcoin. So uh, anyway, it's I'm just pointing out that's what I that's what I find interesting about it. The value proposition, the only value proposition I see over other choices, is that privacy and integrity of the money that that lets you separate from the state. And a lot of people in the in the West, especially, I think, just look at it. In terms of maybe inflation resistance and speculation, um, and um, don't really care about that aspect. And if we were if we were to if the state was to step in some someday and say, this is just flat out money laundering, which kind of you know it, they're getting close to already, and it, it's not it's not legal, right? Then yes. then what does it become, right? What what's left over? Who's mining? Who's accepting? Right? What where are the exchanges? Um, that's the scenario that yeah. we should be working but this is why actually we we together with, with other activists uh trying to uh raise awareness and show our perspective so i fully agree with everything what you said and of course i share what uh what i was saying because this is basically uh knowledge what we try to spread and explain the value of uh, Bitcoin for regulators and legislators of G7 countries. And at the same time, when you say, for example, I want to do just small reference, when you said that you were lucky to uh, be born in the US or like in democracies, uh, no matter how someone evaluated as the good or bad or not enough, it's not something that you are lucky. It's mean yeah, that someone I, I, I from your to say that I don't yeah, like yeah, to yeah. use that term, right? Yeah, yeah, but just someone from your society, family members, no matter, they paid huge price, and this is we yeah. what we right now exercise in, in other countries. Right. Um, a lot of people paying their lives everything basically to to get this standard what you right. enjoy but it doesn't mean it's granted and we understand it and the reason why we defend bitcoin and from other side i'm not a little bit agree with you because 
when democracy is able to criminalize it, uh, freedom technologies, they actually kind of withdraw, they take away our rights to use this instrument properly and actually deliver this humanitarian aid, protect human rights in the country where banking system is just a weapon in the, in the mm -hmm. hands of dictators. And this is the reason why we're saying about it. We don't undermine permissionness. It's fine because Bitcoin itself is going to be money forever. It is going to be there. You can transact, but then people who is touching them, companies which are investing in it, someone who is producing, like mining Bitcoin, they can be under control. And this is something what we can control from our side as active part of civil society. Those who enjoy rights and instruments in democracies, what we call for is actually unite forces, not give up for your rights, actually use your rights and uh, define it. the scope of that control that the state is going to exert we cannot do it in our countries in our countries people actually go to prison for that there are no instruments what we are fighting uh in, in the authoritarian countries is to create the path how we can uh you, you know to create independent branches of power right to be able to elect opposition in the parliaments etc cetera, etc cetera. here in the west you have these instruments and you can influence on the scope of uh the regulations that will be implemented is the question is whether they use it or not you know i'll give you an example about privacy we just uh, recently, right, Luda, we were at, at the European Parliament and spoke with uh, with one of the MPs, and uh, she told us that, you know, like, really, there is very little, e like, we raise very little issues about, like, like the attack on privacy and uh, the risk for privacy. Because but no one asks for. Because nobody asks us. Because our constituency doesn't consider privacy as a Priority. something valuable. Yeah. If there is no value attached to that, they, they're not under attack, so they don't they don't see it. Yeah, right? they, they take it for granted, and it's like like something gets chipped here, there, and everywhere. And mm -hmm. one day they wake up in this digital prison, and mm -hmm. they're like, "Oh, how it happened? Uh, yeah. Nobody expected the Spanish Inquisition, right?" Right, which is <laughs> which makes it that's which what makes it hard sometimes in the West to to defend those principles, yes. right? I mean, yeah, that's why we're calling for solidarity. <laughs> that's why we're explaining. That's why we're bringing cases from all over the world and right. saying, guys, you created great technology. This is really freedom technology. This is something the right. best, what people understood. And I, I think really Satoshi Nakamoto actually looked far beyond in the future. And he understood how financial data and everything around finance is going to be weaponized. So right. we have this privilege right now in our uh, in our hands. But as every human rights, if you don't defend your human rights, you lose it. You just right. lose it. And, and this is sad reality. And we saw it so many times. And this is the reason why we, for example, when industry representative in EU right now, they upload in anti-money loan regulation, say they basically agree with all provisions. While we as end users saying... Yeah. For us, identifying self-hosted wallets or crowdfunding yeah. platforms as a risk uh, activity, especially with use of crypto assets, that means almost the end of our human rights work because we cannot deliver humanitarian aid and support families of political prisoners in authoritarian states. We are all became exposed. So this is different dimensions and different perspective. But I think if we talk more, if we educate each other, if we actually have this open dialogue, then we will find solution and actually would be able to defend our rights. So, so the way I, way I look at, I mean, so this is a lot, a lot of this discussion is about the polit politics of it. And, um, you know, I have this, I've written on this and discussed this quite a bit with people. And so I think sometimes people get the feeling like I'm, I'm against, you know, democratic process for protecting your rights. And, and no, I mean, whatever, you know, whatever works. Um, and, but on the other hand, uh, when it comes to money, say, you know, Bitcoin versus euros or dollars, we have euros, we have dollars, we have all, we've always had these monies and we have, you know, these supposedly democratic states where we can speak up and defend our rights. But that democratic process has never worked to protect the money in the West, right? It, it doesn't prevent, it, even in the US, you know, it's not gonna prevent uh, hyperinflation at some point. And it hasn't, we had hyperinflation during the civil war and we had hyperinflation during the revolutionary war. 
Um, that democratic process didn't protect, you know, Weimar Germany from its hyperinflation or most of, you know, the Eastern European Union, et cetera. There's, there's, there's hundreds, if not thousands of countries, Israel, right, who've had, have had these, who've had these money problems and their democratic process doesn't protect them. So this, that's the status quo. And now if you can get it to work, great, right? But Bitcoin is a statement that that hasn't worked. And so some people are just going to go off on their own and not ask for permission. Asking for permission is great and trying to get it is great. And when it comes to your physical security, really what other choice do you have, right? You're, you, you, you have to um, you know, reform the state somehow. Um, you're not going to get rid of it. Um, but but Bitcoin, if if you can do that, right, if you can reform the state to the point where it's not attacking your money, you don't need Bitcoin. Just use the dollar. Right? It'd be great. It'll yeah, centralize and, CBDC and right? soon. CBDC. No, we would not be able to protect this. So kind of cool. Right, right. So reliable. And and so you, you have to be. And we to don't ask for permission. Right. Um, I mean, right. I, I want just to say when you defend your rights, you not ask for permission. You defend your rights. You show your. Border. I understand the distinction. Yeah. Right. But 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 if the solution is to get the state to respect your rights. Right. Then you don't need Bitcoin because the state. But can states exist to our funds and everything. Right? Yeah. What's that? States like, exist because we pay taxes and we actually right. also elect so, them and so on. We have in, impact on this, you know, in, in democracies. In authoritarian sure. states, you have no impact. You you got basically taken all your properties, yeah. everything, but you have no instrument to, to have impact. In democracies, so, you still have it, you know? Right, and, if, and if we, to the extent we have it, we don't need Bitcoin, right? We can just vote for no, good money. No, we need, because authoritarian okay, regimes we, are way running, more... Then, we can't rely on the state. So it's one or the other, right? We, we can either rely on the state and just vote for good money, or we can we can expect that they're not going to give us good money, and we can go do it ourselves without their permission, right? And maybe you know maybe it's like it's a combination of both, really. But the yeah. but the presumption of Bitcoin is that we do not have that permission, right? We are going to do it without that permission. If we change that assumption, if we say, well, really, Bitcoin requires that we have our rights, right? You know, I'm, I know you I know what you're disagreeing with me saying asking for my rights. I, they are my rights, right? When I say when I say asking for permission, I'm saying I have the ability to defend my rights and you can't take them away. So why would I need Bitcoin? I don't need to hide, right? I can be out in the open. No, so no. The, the, the presumption of Bitcoin <laughs> the is that- The problem is that you are, right now, you, you have Bitcoin, right? This is yeah. not a hypothetical conversation yes. for us. It's either good money or, or use of Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Is the ideal state where the money, the fiat is fixed or Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. We live in the reality. We live in the reality today. We're defending people today. We are dealing with the banks uh, that don't want to open yeah. a bank account today or with the problems of uh, using crowdfunding platforms today. So yeah. what, we are, what we are saying, we have to deal with the issues as they come, right? We are not trying to fix this, uh, you know, kind of uh, philosophical problem of the existence of the state in general. We are saying what, what problems we have in hands. In hands, we have the upcoming anti-money laundering, contrary financing of, of terrorism regulations. How that can affect uh, crypto asset community and specifically users of Bitcoin, right? And then we explain why we ha have to use Bitcoin. We're using it because the banking system is failing. But what right, they're right. doing with that, they're doing the worst. Now they're going to create what they, they're doing right now. We have the state capturing of Bitcoin right now. Yes, that's what they're going to by do. A, they're going by to do attacking that. Bitcoin mining by attacking uh, specifically right. Bitcoin users. They and will do that. They, they will do that probably are. everywhere, right? Yeah. And, but, and but that is why Bitcoin do. matters. Yeah. They, they, they're going to do that. They're going to attack all centralization points, exchanges, mining. Yeah. But um, we should not allow. But you know, we, we, we are fight. here. <laughs> right? We should fight for there, our There's two rights. ways to approach. So, so when, when I, as this is not a this is not a abstract theoretical question that doesn't really matter these are the you know and which is kind of sounded like how you were framing it if we as the tech technology people say behind bitcoin abandon these abstractions it doesn't work anymore right in other words if there's a long, there's a discussion going on right now about scaling which has been going on for over 10 years right mm -hmm. and uh well at least 10 years and this 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 question now is starting to circle around the, the narrative is changing and it's becoming more and more well, we should really, you know, kind of accept Hal Finney's idea of just letting the banks scale it, right? 
in other words, behind the scenes, this is what this is yeah. what was really meant by the Bitcoin standard. Behind the scenes, the government has all the Bitcoin, they do all the transacting, and we use their systems on top of it. And the benefit is, and this is, again, a very Western perspective, the benefit is they can't inflate it. They can't print any more. Okay, so we don't have inflation. It's not really true because of what I told you about basic 51% attack. But if we do that, right, if we say, well, the only, technology wise, you know, it's just, an it's just an abstraction. We really, you know, we care about the reality today. And the reality today is not enough people can use it. So if we put it behind the banks and we let the banks do the scaling, it'll work great. And if we do that, there is no more Bitcoin, right? There is no more benefit for anybody, not in Kazakhstan, not in the US, nowhere, because it's just reverted back to the gold standard which was the dollar, right? And um, whether there's Bitcoin behind it makes no difference whatsoever. So the, this distinction of whether we can defend it from the state, absent any regulatory you know, advantage or pressure is the central issue. If we cannot, if we build a system, you know, and, and believe me, we're still building, right? We're trying to make this work for people. If we design it such that the state can step in and take it, which, it, it's very hard to not do that, to, to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Then these advantages that you want, you see as real practical, real world advantages, they don't exist. Your state can step in and see every single transaction. They can see every mi miner. They can, they can monitor every trade, right? They can prevent any trade. It doesn't, it just doesn't exist anymore. So we as technology people, I, I'm, I'm not a, a opposed in any way to, you know, trying to protect your rights around the world, our rights, whatever, right? But we assume, we have to assume that that doesn't work, right? Because if we assume it works, the whole system devolves down into a very simple centralized PayPal, right? And that's, I don't know if you know, but PayPal started out as a company called Confinity, whose objective was to do just this. Their objective was to allow mobile to mobile, this is way back, right? Mobile to mobile payments so that people for human rights purposes could avoid currency controls. They couldn't that do was it. one of the worst. Oh, it's it turned into the total opposite. They're blocking every transaction. They couldn't do it, so they gave up. Right? Yeah. Yes. They're blocking everything right now when yeah. we're trying to raise money uh, yeah. for TV. So, so to, the only way we can enable what you want as 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 a, as a feature, right, the, the, the true value, is to operate continuously under the assumption that we will never get those rights that we we deserve or the or the what we call permission right we but i think it's a very healthy it. approach honestly because and and, and i don't think we that we have at all curtain contradictions because yeah. what we want we want to defend a right to use bitcoin right now what you want you think about philosophical and future and you develop technology like resistible for all kind of attacks and this is fine because we solve problem right now. So developers, investors, right. miners can operate in democracies, not criminalize. You have time to develop and actually build these instruments in a, using investment, using actually your rights, not being criminalized, right. and using safety of your properties, everything around. It will be way more harder to do all this scaling you know, development once democracies basically label it in regulation with a negative wording or just as a tool as an extremist yeah. terrorist and so on and so on. So what I think we should do in this situation, it's of course our role, what we see, uh, it's to support you guys. But at the same time, we understand that your product, what you actually doing, it's life saving and it's not just words, it's reality. It's life saving for us and everyone whom we love, whom we defend and with whom we live. So um, I don't think we we actually have um, you know any kind of uh, disagreement, right. but just right. different different perspective. Who is acting? Who is doing work right now? And we call to actually not allow right now to criminalize it because we are not at the stage where we can allow to say that okay, we completely can do everything without. Uh, you right, know. You, you hold it off as long as you can and as, and as many places as you can um, to allow people to operate. Like there, there's um, there's certainly concern, I, I, I think among um, open source developers and you know uh, core Bitcoin developers that at some point, even in the West, just working on the code will be criminalized. Yes, and, and, and that, we don't that want has to already allow. happened to some extent. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 it it's come close. Um, you know, mostly people that have been targeted are people who have operated services. Um, money laundering is, you know, is the central buzzword of the whole thing, right? Like you could have predicted, you know, when Bitcoin was first announced that that it would be described as money laundering and an attack like that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, if if I mean, this happened during the fake 
Satoshi stuff too, right? The, some Bitcoiners just stopped working on it because they didn't want to end up in court, didn't want to be exactly. sued. Then there's, then there's the money laundering aspect of it. So if, you know, and some people try to preserve their privacy using pseudonyms working in it today, which doesn't actually work, right? So you're either... <laughs> You're either gambling that your society is going to protect you while you work on this, um, or you just don't do it. I think, you know, doing it privately, you know, I mean, they, they found Red Pirate Roberts, right? It's, um, and he was trying pretty hard to, to, to maintain uh, but what I want to kind of put into a context again, um, we cannot def defend Bitcoin worldwide. Kind of defending Bitcoin is a little bit of third world problem, right? As you say, it's a, we're trying to defend it in the democratic states. So we, because the problems that we are facing in our home countries, we're defending people from from not being tortured. Right. You know, like literally tortured. You probably seen recently how people like those poor photogics were just grabbed by the authorities in Russia and tortured in real time. This is absolutely ridiculous. And again, on the pretext that they were com they committed this uh, horrendous terrorist attack that was actually committed by the state itself, right? But so what, what we are trying to do, we are trying to defend people in that type of situation in our countries, but we need to raise financing, we need an instrument, and we need support of the Western democracies. So here we know that the majority of the investment for the developing of this instrument is actually here. A majority of the coders are here, developers are here. And so we want to have uh, the environment. environment for them, mm -hmm. protected environment here right now, the real time. So they can develop an instrument for us that we can use in the countries uh, back mm -hmm. in our countries that already turning into this digital prisons where yeah. state fully controls banking system and there is no privacy. Yeah. And we see how actually authoritarian regimes right now undermine democracy. So what many of uh, ordinary citizens of EU G7 countries, you know, US, they never notice how their banking data or any kind of data can be easily weaponized. We already not only experience, we suffer it, we overcome it. So we see another value of this instrument and we see how it's really important to work on system in our home. We call G7 countries and democracies our home right now because we cannot actually live in other countries. And we don't want to have this experience, uh, what we experience in our, like, let's say, motherlands, right, uh, there. So this this is our uh, kind of attempt to to protect this safe environment because we know what kind of consequences can happen if just everyone's silent and this is why we're raising awareness that's why we try to organize people and we believe we saw many times when people are organized and bitcoin is one of the most organized communities if they want something to do they actually implement it not like many others implemented. The issue is how we're going to be organized, how we understand our goals. And for example, right, like you and the, uh, the tech developers, you understand your goal, how you have to uh, actually visualize, identify and articulate your goal to make Bitcoin absolutely um, resistible for all of this attack. The same for us, but we speak about environment where you can operate and where afterwards we can expect that this tool is going to be created as yeah. safe as we can use it in, in domestically in, in our uh, right. uh, motherlands. It, yeah. it, it's, a, sorry, it, it's, a, it's important, um, I think worth pointing out at this point <laughs> that the, so I think for a long time uh, in the Bitcoin community, especially for people that are pretty new and, and listen to you know presentations by Andreas and others, they tend to see the technology as providing the security. Um, in other words, uh, you know, if, if if we, you know, I, I don't I don't deserve much credit for this, but all the people that have written uh, core Bitcoin code, right? If we've done it right, then the technology is what secures it, and that's just not the case right technology is never the basis of security for example if i have a firewall you know a, tech, uh, a, a computer firewall in my in my business or in my house right to protect me you would think the firewall is doing the protecting but it's not because somebody who wants to attack my system just walks in the door exactly. and unplugs the firewall right and that's always the case right there, there's always a human being that's at risk when you attempt to secure something from another human being. And, and there's no technology that will ever prevent that. 
So what we do is we build tools. If you think of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is just a tool that allows people to operate more efficiently. In other words, to try to balance the power between individuals. And you can think of that as like a, as like a weapon, a gun, right? What does a gun do? It doesn't defend anybody. Somebody has to pick it up and aim it and shoot it, right? Mm -hmm. Taking risk themselves. And that's exactly how Bitcoin works. And so um, that there's really two aspects of Bitcoin that make it uh, you know, money. There's the mining aspect, and then there's the accepting aspect. Holding it doesn't require anything, right? I don't do anything. I don't need a node. That doesn't do anything either. But when when I accept it from somebody, right, I validate it. I make sure that it's real money and that I that I want it. So I use my technology, my tool to do that. And when I mine it, right, I'm really accepting it from people who are paying fees, right? I'm 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 also accepting it, right? So so when you're accepting this coin, you need a tool to validate it for you. And that tool, um, if it can only operate at large scale in a in a in a, in a way that's highly visible to everybody or centralized. Um, it doesn't allow you to defend yourself very well. But if it can operate at small scale, if everybody can do it in, in their homes or in a cave, you know, with a cell phone, or whatever, then it's much, much harder to stop people from doing it. But the presumption is always that it won't be allowed and therefore illegal. And therefore you will be hiding, you know, like any other common drug dealer, right? Doing your transacting. And um, and the, the way the technology makes it, secure is not by it inherently being secure. The way the technology makes it secure a bull is by making it possible to operate at that low scale and still be competitive against somebody like a 51% miner who's trying to shut you down, right? You, if you're not competitive, if you're operating at a very highly, this, this is actually the case, right? Small miners operate at a competitive disadvantage to highly centralized miners because the process is more efficient where, where everything is closer together. You see the blocks sooner than everybody else, right? Um, and you you get rewards more frequently, which means you have you have less capital costs. So so we're trying to work on there's a operation called Braid Pool right now, which you know finally got funded. And it's trying to it's trying to um, reduce that imbalance between small scale mining and large scale mining so that when it's not allowed, people will still be able to do it. And that's really all we mean when we say it's secure, right? You can you can maybe do it if you're willing to take the risk and you have some place to hide. That's it. That's it's what we, exactly what we don't want. Like, I, and I'm telling you as a refugee, I don't want to hide. I want to operate in the open. I want to no. have this tool. I know. To sure. Say, Everybody wants that. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's why we have to go and speak with the regulator. We explain the value yeah. of this technology. Why the technology in general is neutral. It can be used for bad or for good. But it's the technology itself is neutral and should not be criminalized. Right. But and, I just want I just want to point out that that's a political solution, right? Yeah, getting that yeah, permission or, or getting those rights, right? It's a political solution, which we already have without Bitcoin. Bitcoin operates under the presumption that and the only thing that secures it, right, is that willingness to do it when it's not allowed. Nobody wants to be doing it when it's not. Well, maybe maybe some people think maybe they can make a better profit doing something illegal, right? But but really, we we don't. Nobody wants to operate that way. We we do that because that's the only choice, right? Nobody wants to break out their pitchforks and man the barricades, you know, and, and have a revolution either. They, they'd rather just live in peace. But that's kind of, um, you know, the proposition with Bitcoin is if they're not going to allow us to do that, we have this tool that makes it, 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 it helps level the playing field, right? It, it creates a more of a, a balance of power between individuals and the state. Um, if we don't need it, then that's great. That's wonderful. And the less we need it, the better. And maybe, you know, in some places where we don't need it, we can, we, like, like you said, we can work on it and, and provide it. Uh, more easily to other people who do need it. But I, I, I'm pretty sure that if the government of Kazakhstan doesn't want people to do it, right, the only way they're going to be able to do it is is by hiding, right? And um, and that's better than nothing. You again said allowing. If they don't allow us, and we're mm -hmm. saying that we have these rights, it's not about something they should allow us. Well, that we remind them to actually right, right. respect <laughs> our rights. And if we right. organize enough, enough, if we talk together, if we actually enough local, we put accountable these guys. And this is the reason why, for example, I, Bota and many other of our activists, we were now in threat to national security because we effective in accountability mechanism of right. those guys who violate human rights. And we know right. that it works. 
So and, and this hopefully Bitcoin works. can make it more effective, right? Right. You can fund operations within Kazakhstan, for example, get people money, allow them to operate. Um, that makes it more effective, right? Then ho hopefully, um, but if if you can be completely effective with just the politics of it, you, you really don't need Bitcoin, right? You can just solve the problems of the politics. Bitcoin uh, solving problem of econ uh, of politics. I, I, I'm, you want I'm it or you don't want it. <laughs> yeah. Eric, I just get a little bit confused when you uh, kind of say, "Oh, it's a political decision," and you kind of dismiss the issue from the table yeah, of the table. No, it's, it's a big issue. It, it's and, a central issue. Uh, but that's it's what, what we, about. we are trying to say. That first of all, it's not a political solution. It's a political tools that we can use in order to get some to some kind of solution, right, of the problem. Mm -hmm. And what we are trying to do, we are trying to kind of bring together the Bitcoin community together with the human rights and activist community and try to defend this instrument with those political right. tools that are actually available to us in the uh, developed world, in the democratic mm -hmm. countries. And this is what we, we, the only thing that we are trying to do. It's the race awareness that you guys, in the end of the day, yourself, you don't want to operate in a gray area because we know what it is to operate in yes. a gray area. Right. So you want to be legit, you want to have your uh, Bitcoin to be protected, your Bitcoin mining activities to be uh, just just as any other uh, business activities. So in order to achieve that, we have to unite and show to the regulator that we consider it's valuable, uh, valuable from different, from the economic perspective, from social perspective, uh, this is and a going to defend our rights. Yeah, yeah. and, and like then it's defend marathon, our like rights. And, 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 and then the rights, tools, yeah. political tools, bec uh, like you know, they create some sort of solution. What we we just don't want to have this political nihilism that exists in the Western countries, where people they have so much rights right now, they take it by default, and mm -hmm. they don't consider that it's necessary to defend them. But it's again, it's like with privacy and even with money, like cash. You have to defend your right to use cash yeah. because in mm -hmm. the end of the day, you're going to end up, uh, you you know, in a digital state where there is like uh, privacy is, is not an issue because you have none. Cash is not an issue because you have that. And you cannot really operate Bitcoin because there is so much surveillance around you. And again, mm -hmm. like, like you have to fight against that surveillance and how you fight using those democratic paths that exist. What you have in the the privilege. Yeah. Yeah. So those are those are political solutions, and I don't dismiss yeah. them. They're important, but that's not okay. Big, good. <laughs> Bitcoin's not a not not voting, right? It's it's just a tool like a gun that people use when they want to. And if you can convince you know states to allow more of its use, that's great. But you know, I, it's, it's, not, it's not dismissive, it's a separation, right? There's an idea like th there is this whole process of people trying to obtain their, you know, to, to, to take their rights back from the other people who don't want them to have them. Right. That's an important and global process that's going you know, to go on throughout the course of human history. And it's extremely important. And to, to Bitcoin, um, you know, can operate under, with, with with your rights or without your rights. It You know, it shouldn't have to matter, right? That's the whole point is that it doesn't have to have permission. Um, the more you can, the, the more freedom you have from the state, the better. Not dismissing that in any way. Um, but I would dismiss any Bitcoin um, technology, right? Any proposal that requires it, that requires permission. Because that defeats this for sure. Purpose, this is what right? we don't want exactly. Right. That's why yeah. we're saying the technology has to be neutral and language has to be neutral, so everyone can use it and it's actually protect rights. And then you have all law enforcement, all agents, which we pay taxes quite a lot, and they have to do their work, not just by default uh, saying that this technology right. is uh, used by criminals and everyone who is using it is criminals. No, no, this is, shouldn't be like this. You know, this, this is our message. Yeah. Mm. Um, I have a question. Uh, it's not philosophical, but actually a very fundamental question. I mean, you talk about good democracy, Ludmila, often. I mean, uh, after so many years, you know, in the Bitcoin space and reading and, and you know, contemplating and meditating, I, I don't have any faith or trust whatsoever in any political or so-called democratic structures or governmental structures or state structures. So when you, Eric, said, um, I think you believe or you think realistically it's not possible to... 
abolish it or something like that? Whether, whether those are your words, that the state itself it cannot be abolished, but like to, like reformed. Is that like realistically speaking, or would would you also have the desire as an uh, as can I call it crypto anarchist or Bitcoin anarchist to <laughs> to abolish? I mean, to make the state obsolete. Isn't that the ultimate goal? Whose goal? Well, uh, the goal of, of being the, go the government or the state should just be service provider, actually. You know, this is why I think I'm a well, huge that's the market, so there's no government, services, right? You know? it, 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 yeah. So if you're asking me what my philosophy on freedom and, you know, anarchy is, um, I, so I, I don't look at anarchy or, you know, kind of total libertarianism as an attempt to at, to destroy this for the state not to exist you know, of course that, that would be ideal but um i don't operate under that I'm not, I'm not out trying to tear down institutions and create you know um what people imagine as anarchy to me it's a personal philosophy right i don't condone um stealing right that and it's it's too abstract but so when people say the non-aggression principle people get confused because they don't really you know what's aggression it gets really confusing i i just look at it simply the the one moral principle you don't steal Right. If a person owns their own body, then it all falls under no stealing. So that's 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 what I see as morality, right? The, the moral principle in the world, and what I see states uh, as is a is a system of systematic stealing or aggression, right? Uh, therefore, immoral. Does that mean I can eliminate it, or I imagine it being eliminated? No. It, so to me, it's a it's the, it's the distinction between accepting that there always will be murder, and not condoning it right there's a difference between saying murder's great it's okay it's fine it's it's a normal everyday thing and we like it or um you know it's always going to exist but we don't condone it and that's the way i, I tend to look at the state something like the state may always exist it doesn't mean i support it or condone it because i see it as immoral it's not a contradiction to live that way um and i think you know practically speaking people who feel that way end up as kind of libertarians minarchists right people sure, trying to would you, would you minimize agree the, the damage to reduce of the, the state. service provider you know just the simple well, what's you know, a service basic. provider what's the service right to me a service provider is just protect the property everything protect security protect the basic fundamental human rights and just, you know well, just like, i live in the u.s and even here like the government, you know, state doesn't protect my property. There's no cops standing around here protecting it. It's me. I do it. Right. And then we go to court and figure it out later. That's how it really works. Right. People defend their own stuff. But what is court? What is court? <laughs> What's that? What is court? Court is it just judiciary branch of the state. It's not a defense. It's, it's not, one of it's the not hands the defense, of the state. Right? It's, 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 how you, it's how you settle disputes, I guess. Right. But it's not... It's not a guy with a gun standing at your front door protecting your family from murderers. That's not the court, right? People have, even in the U.S., there's no obligation for the police to pr protect us from, from violent crime. That's our own obligation. They, they do things like, you know, try to solve, figure out what happened. Maybe if, if it happens to happen right in front of them, even then, th there's been plenty of cases where, they, where it's been decided they don't have an obligation to protect you. So the, 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 again, we're getting very philosophical here, but the, the point is that when you talk about a service provider, that's the state doesn't make things right it doesn't make products it doesn't you know do it doesn't even really provide defense it hires people and they do it right mm -hmm. so and it takes taxes it spends the money and it does the stuff well the market does that the free market builds the roads the free market builds the airplanes they build the faa stuff they build all this stuff right they even print the dollars right there's these machines that are made are all done by the market that's your service provider. The question is, what do you want the state to do? Because the state exists independent of the market. The market is free and voluntary, right? This is voluntary cooperation. The state is what's involuntary. A, a majority, say, for example, in a, in a supposedly democratic state, the majority can force other people to do what it wants. That's the state. Market can't do that, right? In a free market, nobody's forcing anybody to do anything. So... Um, you know, again, there's there's the theory. So if the question is, what do what do I want? I want I want free and voluntary, right? I want voluntary interaction, which means no state by definition. Who provides the services? People do, just like they do with the state, right? People provide each other services. We trade voluntarily. Um, so that's maybe what you call the utopian, right? That's the if there's no state, this happens. I don't sit here and pretend that's going to happen. I just don't. Like in, in the in the murder analogy, right? I don't condone it. I don't say 
yeah, let's let's go over to my neighbor's house and take all their shit so we can put up a school, right? And if and if they resist, we shoot them, right? That's the way I look at the state, right? A bunch of people getting together and robbing their neighbors to get what they want. Um, and I don't condone that. So I don't vote. I, I don't advocate for, you know, anything but reducing the scope of it. Okay. Um, and I build tools that help people defend themselves from it to the extent that they can. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I uh, Cody Wilson is a, is a friend of mine. What did he do? Right. He built a tool that let people 3D print their own guns. And as far as I know, um, out in the, you know, in the in the forest of Myanmar, people do just that. They use his technology and maybe some Bitcoin. Right. Some of Satoshi's technology to get some money, to get some stuff, to print some guns, to defend themselves against their state. Right. Um you it don't want to be in a situation when you're in the forest of Miramon, believe it, me. It's not, a, it's not that anybody <laughs> wants it. These are not choices um, that they have, right? They don't want that. I know that. I don't want it either. But that's but better off with the we tools. have a failing state that fails to provide basic public goods that the state actually has to provide, such as security, such as uh, uh, like, like certain freedoms, such as a food supply, etc. It's just functioning state. And um, I, but I just uh, I see that we have a little bit um, in in general we don't disagree right on on especially mm -hmm. on the purpose of Bitcoin but we a little bit uh, disagree with the approaches and how we view the state because we don't look at the state from this kind of Gobs's perspective that it's some kind of Leviathan that exists and is separate and we, like we people vis-a-vis -vis the state. We consider state, first of all, it's an institution that run by people. Institutions mm -hmm. by run people. We are exactly. part, we are part of that community. It's the question, who are those people that run uh, that uh, those institutions and how much accountability they exactly. have. And what we are fighting for in every authoritarian country, uh, like, like uh, every opposition is fighting for, is actually to force the, those who are in power to have some accountability. Sure. And when we are saying that the state can do this, those things and that things, no, it's certain people, they abuse power. And we have to use institutions, laws, and again, other people, elected politicians, for example, or proper judges, right, and even activists to defend the rights that already exist in the law. So yeah. state for us is not something abstract, some yeah. abstract dark power that doesn't produce. We actually, we come from the countries where, you know, for example, pension system is failing. Mm -hmm. uh, like, like, there's no such public good as a, you know, as education. There are no social leaves, for example, sure. right? So this is something that is like we know that market economy, and that was proven already. Like, like you know, I don't have to go with that, but yeah. market economy creates a lot of negative externalities, and there are a lot of market failures that actually state corrects. Without the state, there will be no defense of disabled people. Of uh, you know, we children. can disagree on that. Can, yeah, but uh, okay, <laughs> no we can disagree. We, oh, absolutely, there is like. Uh, there are so I mean, of, you know, we're, we're but trying... at the end of the day, when you compare authoritarian country and the, uh, the the country, democratic country, what the biggest difference is how those institution works and how much pol accountability politician has or should have. And right. is, I, mean, I don't. There's no disagreement here, right? There, there, yeah. there, there are le, there are more bad and less bad states, right? And yeah. you can call some of them good if you want net goods. And philosophically, I would disagree with that. But it doesn't really, from a practical standpoint, doesn't matter. There are there are ones that are more more bad than others for sure. But no, but it's a agree. question of whether you're withholding yourself from this process or you actively get involved and try yes. to influence the it. actions of the state. That's it. That, that's it. Yeah, that's each it. individual, you know, takes a different approach. My approach is to build tools, right? Uh, Cody's approach was to build tools. Other people get involved in politics. My son, you know, prefers to be uh, politically active, right? Um, about these things, more of a libertarian type. So th those are those are all fine approaches, right? The the it, it's just when it comes to Bitcoin, right? we have to know what the threat is and whether you see say the u.s government or the i mean i i, I tend to see i prefer to live here right the u.s government is the, one of the least bad in the world but um from my perspective but on the other hand it's the threat right when it comes to bitcoin what 
state in the world is the most aggressive at eliminating monetary privacy and controlling other states, right? Sweden, Switzerland, finally, after, I don't know, 100 years or so, gave up their banking privacy laws because of the United States, because of pressure from the United States after 9-11, right? It happened in the last few years. So, so the, in terms of Bitcoin surviving and, and making an impact even in other countries, right? It has to be able to withstand um, that threat, right? The, the, for example, whether or not it's allowed to exist in, say, all of Europe, for example, would be irrelevant if the United States decides to 51% attack it. So we have to we have to realistically design against the actual threat, and the actual threat is, um, you know is really, really strongly interested in defending its one of its primary taxing mechanisms, which is the money, right? Um, there's a reason why nearly every country in the world prints its own money. There's, there's only a handful that, that, that use other countries' money. Um, and that's because it's a major source of tax revenue. And however you feel about the, the individual states morally, they have a very, very strong interest in protecting that tax revenue. And whatever they despite whatever they may say about human rights, et cetera, um, you can already see Western states coming down strongly you know, on the side of controlling Bitcoin. And ultimately that will very likely continue to the point where unless we um, are willing to operate without their permission, right? In other words, legally, we won't be able to operate. Yeah, can I tie that? And, and then, then it won't exist and it won't help anybody. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, can I tie that because it's a pronounced, you know, topic? So I want to talk about just just a short, uh, yeah, uh, because you're right in the middle of it. Uh, can I just uh, screen share this? It's I think by TFDC, you know, a pretty good summary about the EU regulation. Um, so it's going to be voted. I mean, by some bunch of you know unelected <laughs> institutions again. You know, I'm a citizen of, of the European Union, and I can't even really. I don't even really influence. But uh, it's about this uh, limit on anonymous cash payments, commercial transactions over three thousand euros, and business transactions over above ten thousand will be prohibited in cash. Furthermore, the AML KYC, uh, which I want to have your feedback uh, um, or your input, uh, Bota and uh, Ridmilit. Um, checks will be mandatory for all Bitcoin payments to custodial wallets operated by regulatory services providers. The final vote in the law is scheduled by, for April 22nd. Now, you know, I mean, that's again, you know, we're coming, we, you touched upon, upon it, you know, you discussed it, you know, thoroughly. Uh, why, I mean, the, the whole point of Bitcoin is being permissionless. I mean, uh, and I know, you know, Bota and Ludmilla, you, you, in, you are involved in this whole process of, you know, financial you know, task force, all these un unelected, unaccountable institutions, who knows, you know, who's behind this, who's funding it, what's incentives. Uh, what is your opinion? I mean, um, where, where is this heading to? If I may uh, start, so we need to understand th uh, a few things. Uh, we, as Open Dialogue Foundation, uh, together with other activists, created a Building to Change Coalition, what is also one of our co-founders, and uh, uh, we conducted over 200 meetings with legislators and regulators, Re legislators, members of the parliaments, elected people. And it's very important because they supported our recommendations uh, at that time. And European Parliament uh, back in April uh, last year supported position, basically recognizing that crypto assets can be used for payment, for fundraising, that we need to protect financial data, uh, that crowdfunding should be also as a tool uh, uh, with reasonable uh, kind of... Uh, mm, let's say, the collection of the data for enabling civil society operate, especially in emergency situation, exactly also with uh, use of crypto assets. And then European Parliament, uh, together with Council of Europe and uh, European Commission, came for so-called trilog procedure. This is so-called silent procedure. And most of the criticized procedure in the EU as the most undemocratic, untransparent, um, uh, low process um, in, in, uh, in, in 27 member states, affecting 500 million of people. And during this process, all of our recommendations were withdrawn. And this mm -hmm. is the reason uh, why we want to differentiate. Uh, and our call, for example, right now addressed to 
members of European Parliament. And what we want from every Bitcoiner, their family members and friends, whatever, we need their active position so they call their members of parliament and ask to actually vote against withdraw this draft because this draft affects end users of bitcoin specifically self-hosted wallets because it's identified as immediately as risk transaction and of course we don't agree with these limits we don't agree also with a language used uh, towards to cash and consequences what we see not maybe directly written there but actually what can affect us and i want to what i ask uh, to be maybe more specific but um as a lawyer but fr from from my perspective as a human rights defender this is something where we have to take stand we have to be active right now because we can make this change happen especially right now before elections in the european union so this votes 22nd of april every bitcoiner who is living in the european union or you have friends in the european union use your privilege and right to contact with your member of the parliament and ask him not to vote against privacy, financial freedoms, because this is what will uh, actually happen with us. Our banking data uh, will be uh, like the same. There is no improvement. It will be the same exposed like before, even maybe at some point more. Yep. Uh, and the same, we speak about freedom tools and freedom technologies like self-hosted Bitcoin uh, peer-to-peer -peer transactions will be identified as a risk transaction. The same crowdfunding Based yeah, with on crowdfunding again. Yeah, but if you may be more detailed on this regard, so well, I understand. think that we have very little time. But what I want to say is that we we going to have a policy paper, like our statement with respect to each position that we highly disagree, and we want to raise to the attention of the members of the European Parliament. And we consider that we really need support. Uh, like like if anyone who wants to join and sign our statement, please please do. But what we worry, we basically go into the area of, again, over-regulating that, like, like what Luda already mentioned, self-hosted wallets, for example, right? They go into treat it as something that requires additional, uh, additional compliance. What it's going to be in the reality, we know what it's going to be in reality, that any regulated entity, they will not want to deal with the compliance for smaller entities or for individuals, right? That don't have a lot of uh, money on their self-hosted wallets. So they basically will be de-risking them, just not taking them as a client, which means that in the end of the day, it will be impossible for people like us to go into fiat or from fiat to uh, self-hosted wallets. That's their objective, yeah. Yeah, that, that's their objectives. But this is something that was added during the trilogue. And we need to go back. We need to, unless we don't say anything, uh, this is how it's going to be. We really have to put limitations. What, what is important is even uh, not what is, is in this document, but it's what is not in that document. For example, there are no guarantees against unwarranted de-risking. And this is something that we were fighting very much for. And that was in the text, but now it was all removed. And, and this is extremely important because like I, I'll just give you as a general trend, um, as a general trend, we will see that there will be with this increased compliance burden, with an increased regulatory burden, we will basically have raised to the to top in terms of the regulation. And it means that the burden becomes so high that you uh, there will be a barrier to entry. For not only we now see it in uh, banking, for example, industry, right, that only big banks survive because of all this regulatory burden, but we're going to see it in crypto asset sector as well, where you basically end up with uh, 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 um, uh, crypto asset services providers that will be run by the banks, will be large uh, large entities that will be complying and all smaller independent entities will be basically removed from the market because of this increased burden. So this is not the time to be quiet. This is, we have to raise it as an issue. We have to raise it as an issue during the upcoming elections to the European Parliament in uh, that, that will be in June of this year. So when we have in September new parliament, we really start working from the outset and making sure that things like, like that don't happen because otherwise they can they can always make things worse. You know, this is this is what we always uh, should remember. That's why we asking 
get involved in the process. Please become active. Start defending your rights. Okay, I see. But uh, would that be like a practical question? Like, would it be like a, uh, what do you call it? Like a template or something like a, you know, sample letter that you can just fill out? And, you know, for most people, you know, I mean, I know how to formulate a, a, a letter. Yeah, we, yeah Luda, you, you, can, you can say on that what we're going to do. Yeah, I mean, we can prepare key, key messages, what a person should address to member of the parliament. But you need to remember, uh, Everyone in Europe, it's not like in the US that you can just spam, right? No one is going to react by chat GBT created messages. This is going to be just um, kind of even embarrassing and, and uh, you know, not, not affecting. It will be treated as just, uh, you know, just bots being set, used, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, of course, we will do this the main work. So we will show exactly where is the most weakest point from our perspective as human defenders and end users of Bitcoin. Because we saw already position of uh, crypto asset services providers and industry representatives, they basically happy about these provisions. But uh, we, as those yeah, who actually the bigger they are, the more it, regulation they want, right? I mean, it, it I mean, we don't against completely about regulation. We can we against provisions which violates our rights and financial freedoms and sure. and label technologies with negative language. Th this is what we are against for. So. I want to be also precise because I know how legislation saved a lot of lives and I work to actually on, on this regard also. So so I, I want to be also precise on this. Oh, that this is what you meant by neutral language, like inserting. Exactly. Okay. Yes, okay. exactly. Exactly. Yes. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I still alive and water also because there is a regulation and laws which allows other institutions to, to protect us against uh, all violations which other regimes wanted or their proxies to do with us on, uh, for example, Bel Belgian soil. And it's very practical for us. It, it's, this is why we survive right now and we can talk with you. <laughs> so, so, so very practical, right? And uh, um, so, so this is one thing. The second thing uh, is to, of course, use these messages and go into face-to-face -face meetings. Right now, all politicians seeking to meet you, they want your vote. And this is when they care about your position. And as Bota said, it's really important when politicians say that you care about privacy, financial privacy, about freedom technology, that it has to be with neutral language. It means that it's not labeled as an instrument for criminals, by default risk activity, and so on and so on. We will include in our messages these proposals, but it's your duty to find these meetings in your constituency, meet this person, and with your words, with examples from human defenders, say about it, talk about it, talk about it on the general meeting so all other voters are aware about these risks. So, and this is going to do scale results where yeah. we basically one by one yeah. raise this awareness it's effort but yeah. this is really makes changes and we saw it in many societies even authoritarian societies and i believe it should work also in democracies okay uh you know for the sake of uh of, of efficiency i mean there's usually like i i do that all, all the time you know i look for what kind of petitions there are you know and you know like pop i, I don't know what's the english terminology but it's like um, um uh, population petition or something like that and i can sign it digitally as you know and then when it reaches like a specific number whatever 200 300,000 people then the parliament sort of in austria at least you know is is required or obligated sort of to discuss it and and elaborate on it and you know for drafting the, the new law or something like that so that would be i think also very yeah useful. but this is undermining a bit uh, because you already right now have vote there is right now discussion you don't need to initiate this procedure okay. it's here mm -hmm. you just need to use your vote when parliamentarians come in to you and asking you you don't need to ask them for anything you just actually saying what you expect from them mm -hmm. so you are not at this stage of course you can initiate and then wait two years because there is a huge line of petitions but why you should lose this time yeah no, I mean, maybe there's something similar on the EU level or something, you know, not on a national and, uh, level. We, we will be, uh, we are finishing our uh, statement. You can, you know, share our statement. If you mm -hmm. translate it in different EU languages, that will be a big help for us. Uh, that uh, if you can share with them uh, MPs from uh, your jurisdiction, that will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right, Eric, do you want to add something? Mm -hmm. I can't vote in the EU. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to, uh, there's this wonderful art uh, or transcripted interview with you, Lidmila. Uh, and I think one of the last questions, the last paragraph, it says, are there any specific projects you plan to develop in the future that you would like to share with us? 
And you say our short-term plans are to expand the capacity to educate activists on the use of Bitcoin. I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna add the link, you know, to that. Uh, mm -hmm. I posted it also as a preparation. So I think it's a, a very succinct point that you make uh, uh, also in, in connection with the Open Dialogue Foundation uh, and, you know, the, the uh, what do you call it? The, the, the BTC coalition. Coalition. Coalition, 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 yeah. coalition. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can just elaborate a little bit on the last paragraph. Yeah, sure. So one of the key uh, aspects, what we try to do, we um, actually give in teaching people when they financially excluded how they can use peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So activists who completely financially excluded in different authoritarian countries, we teach them what technologies we know, how to uh, actually use these privacy payment instruments and uh, fundraise to support their family members and, and protect themselves. And for this reason, we believe it's crucial also to educate regulators in G7 countries. And this is the reason why we mentioned financial action task forces, OECD organizations, because these organizations, again, using negative language towards to Bitcoin and, and um, privacy payment instruments. And we as civil society, we change reform. I mean, we change quite a future uh, uh, institution reform of principle was completed. So this is the reason why we are not abstract in our, th uh, in our um, you know, ideas. We know that it can be implemented, but we need support. And we need, of course, support technological. So while we fight in people anyways can use it. We need support expertise. For example, we call in miners, Bitcoin miners to provide us their testimonials so we can defend mining in front of regulators, explaining it's actually positive externalities for environment, energy security, and local communities who has no, for example, access to electricity. And at the same time, we protect ex exactly privacy instrument, bringing voices of civil society from all over the world in front of regulators of G7 countries, in front of legislators of G7 countries whom they want to defend and whom they defend, actually. And they ask how we can support you guys. And then we have the answer. Don't please put negative language towards to privacy payment instruments and towards to Bitcoin peer to peer transactions because we don't have other financial tools. You cannot resist against regime if you have no means for existence. And in order to do all of this work, of course, we need financial support because we need to travel. We need to pay, for example, uh, for um, hotels and so on. We need to have professional team who is working on it. It's very systematic work. Amendment, for example, 800 pages of some <laughs> laws, right? And so on and so on. So if you want to be effective, you need to participate, you need to support, and you need to have solidarity. What we try to do, we actually try to organize all of this process. I know it sounds ambitious, for someone even maybe impossible, but we prove for our 15 years of uh, existence and work that everything what is impossible is possible with solidarity, bringing people out of the most dangerous prisons with solidarity, with uh, understanding who can help. And we, we do need it. And actually example of Bota's brother who was in the most severe conditions, tortured. Uh, like everyone said that it's impossible. It's possible. We, we released him and many other hundreds of other people. Yeah, thank, thank you for all your relentless work. Uh, seriously. And this is the, uh, the, the website uh, of the Open Dialogue Foundation. This is where also people can donate or, or propose yes. some, I don't know, a cooperation or support. I mean, Eric, do you have any other ideas how we can, you know, multiply the, the, the effect or, or, or any, any do, you, do you know any people who might be interested in your network in any shape or form, you know, technologically or infrastructurally? <laughs> My ne my network is is you know a bunch of Twitter followers and people I know that work on Bitcoin I guess um, uh, you know I I'd be happy to 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 forward this out and um, you know uh, make people aware uh, I I already you know re retweeted the, uh, the 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 stream today but uh, yeah whatever I can do I'd be happy to help um, I don't you. know if that's much but thank you Eric. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not, you know, I don't have a big following, I'm, I'm too. Um, and we use BTC Pay servers, yeah. so we also use this instrument and we teach activists in different mm -hmm. different countries how to use BTC Pay servers, so yeah. it's one of the most effective tools for actually crowdfunding. I, I spend most of my time just trying to make the software, you know, better and usable um, and Thank you. That's what we yeah. need. <laughs> yes, exactly. Make it easier to, uh, the transactions because it's so hard. 
uh, teach people. It's like, like you know, it's something not intuitive, and we need it in different languages. Yes, we might, well. you know, to me, it's, yeah. it's really just software engineering, right? You just, it's, 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 it's just some, something that I've done because I've done a couple of companies. Yeah. I worked at IBM. I worked at Microsoft. I can, I know how to, you know, kind of make it pro professional, maintainable, more usable, and. It's, it's, it feels like a small thing, but you know, yeah, I know, I know, I know it can it can help in, in some way. Um, you know, that that ability to operate without custodial wallets, right? To, to do it yourself is really, is really important. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't doesn't garner a big following. I'm not like Kayvon here, who's got the big microphone, he's got all these followers, but I'm just I'll a small podcast. <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> um, Thank you, Eric. And and I and I, I want to thank you both uh, for, for your work and, and what you've done. It's you know it, it's important. Yeah, totally indispensable, relentless, you know, human rights advocacy. I mean, it's, it's the, the things that you, you know, described is, it's, I think, beyond imagination for the average person, you know, what you and others, you know, have gone through. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, why we, we need to connect and, and yeah, we have the, the problems and the causes and, and the solutions. So uh, Ludmila, Bota, Eric, thank you all for your time, you know, and uh, yeah, and um, call to action. <laughs> for everybody. Yeah. Be Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, guys, for Freedom Tech and be active. Yeah. Yeah. Defend Thank you. Right. Yeah. All Thanks right. Put everything in the show mark. Uh, show, <laughs> okay. show notes. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.